Ladies and gentlemen, we can begin the program. My name is Dave Reese, and I'm here at the Potomac Institute, and thanks for coming today. On behalf of Mike Swetnam, our CEO, and the chairman of our Board of Regents, General Al Gray, the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, it's, it's great to see the crowd here today. Uh, Potomac Institute, apolitical, uh, and likes to tackle some of those thorny issues. Today, I think, uh, is right online. I see some of the regular faces here that have been to several of our programs and some new ones, and that's great. Uh, whenever I hear Dave and Katuna talk, it's a pleasure for both the education and the entertainment. Uh, <laughs> and I mean that in a very good way. Uh, I think you're going to get both of them today. Uh, this couldn't be more timely. I think that's why you're all here. This is a nice, small group. So while they talk, I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll stimulate your minds. You'll have some questions, and we expect a good dialogue. The food's available throughout. Please don't be shy. Make, make yourself at home. And David Katuna, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you again for coming. General Reese, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us today. I hope we will be as entertaining and informative as General Reese says we will be. Uh, but uh, we'll give that a try. Yeah, this is kind of timely. This presentation, by the way, has been around for about three years. We constantly update it. So if you have seen it before, a year ago or so, it is different. Some of the things, of course, remain the same, particularly when we talk about history. And we do have a little bit about what's going on with uh, social media in, uh, in Russia that's just literally breaking now. And of course, what's going on in Ukraine, or at least my best assessment of what's going on in Ukraine, uh, because those things are always a little bit unclear. Uh, you know, if you just just if you if you if you um, Google Russia and cyber, you're going to get thousands and thousands of hits. This is just a representative, uh, and I'm going to step away from the microphone so people can hear. But you need to tell me if 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 you're still getting audio from where I if I stand back a little bit, that works. Okay. Um, I, I like the one up at the top from Jeff Carr, who many of you probably know. Uh, you know, the Russians kind of have a style that's a little different from the Chinese. Uh, there's kind of a, it, it, it's kind of become a nostrum in this business that, that it's the Chinese that are out there. And yeah, there's Russians and there's others, but it's always, it's the Chinese. Well, the Chinese have a different style. And don't, don't get me wrong, I'm certainly not saying the Chinese are not a problem. They're a big problem. But they kind of have a workaday style. They come to work. They work for a large organization. It may be the Chinese state. It may be an organization that is working in the employ or at least in cahoots with the Chinese state. And they put in their day. And that can be measured, by the way, from the time they start their activity to the time they end their activities. And it's uncanny uh, how that goes with the Chinese workday. What is, what, is uh, uh, what is the time on the east coast of China? Um, and they're not real um, stealthy about the way they work. They get in. They get what they need to get. If somebody discovers them and blocks them, they go around. They find something else. Their job is to come home with the bacon. And they do that. The Russians have kind of a different uh, view of things. Part of it's cultural, but part of it's also the economic organization of, of Russia, the way this stuff works. These guys don't really work for a big organization. They work for themselves, or they work for a small organization. And you make your reputation by being stealthy, by the art of the whole thing. So the art of not only getting the bacon and bringing it home, but actually having nobody see your fingerprints in there is part of what they do. So I think a lot of times, just take a look at that top quote there, a lot of times we just didn't catch their hands in the cookie jar, but believe me, they're out there. Then a note about Katuna uh, Mishvidobadze, who is going to take over in a few moments, and me. Uh, we're very popular on the Runet, as the Russians call their portion of the internet. Uh, I've discovered there's one site that has literally translated every article I've ever written, uh, so I'm very, very flattered. Uh, we, uh, we get a lot of comments. Uh, some of them are less than favorable uh, about some of the things we say. Uh, actually, some of them are quite a bit less than favorable. Um, but you know, we're pretty popular, which I guess means that, that we're hitting the nail on the head here, um, as we should be. Let's just talk a little bit about mirror imaging. This is really important when you do intelligence analysis. You've got to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. You've really got to see it the way he or she is seeing the world. Uh, and be very careful that you're not bringing in biases uh, due to your own culture. Now, we all have biases. We stop for green lights. 
Uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. We stop for green lights. We go in green lights and we stop for red lights. Okay, so you see, you see how things can be very different. Um, you know, and we kind of make an assumption that everybody understands that green is a go sign, red is a stop sign, uh, and we even use that. Go on social media. Go on any. Go on the GUI. Uh, of just about any site, and you'll sort of see the notion that green means go something, red means stop something. We have those assumptions. It didn't have to be that way. It's just somehow that's how it became accepted. Let's take a look at Russia. You know, sometimes they look like us. They, they dress like us. Uh, there's a certain Europeanness about them, and I think sometimes we make the mistake of believing that the Russians are like us, and they're not. And I hear this every day. Flip on the news and listen to the leaders of our country, of Germany, of France, of Britain, too. It's not just an American thing. Um, and you get this mirror imaging. Surely they must see. How many times did we hear they won't attack Georgia because it's not in their interest? Well, they won't attack Georgia because it's not in their interest as you perceive their interest. Now, they may be totally wrong, but that's not how they see it, OK? So things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, remember, we're doing open source intelligence. We do not have access. Uh, to classified information of this or any other country. Every once in a while we do this for one of our own security agencies. We're usually told, yeah, you've got it. We don't have anything that you don't have. I'm sure there's lines of code and stuff that we obviously we don't have. But basically, uh, we seem to, to be able to pick this stuff up. Um, the, one of the major things there is number two to take away. They have a different view of information warfare. We have these little categories. Is it is it information warfare? Is it cyber warfare? Is it cyber warfare? Is it electronic warfare? Is it, we have all of these little divisions. They don't. Their big category is information warfare. Newspapers, television, they're tools. Propaganda is a tool. Computer is a tool. You, pil you pick whatever arrow out of the quiver that you may need. And when we talk about Ukraine, you'll see why I'm telling you that, because I think the difference in the different arrows that were chosen from Georgia to Ukraine literally has a lot to do with the situation. It was not, it was not needed, so they did something a little bit different. The other thing you've got to remember is Russia was not hatched in a vacuum. No country was. We're the product of our own history, so are they. When you hear somebody tell you everything is different, everything changed, communism is, is, is finished, it's a completely different country, you're talking to, frankly, you're talking to an idiot, okay? I've heard this, unfortunately, in very high places in this town, uh, but this is, this is something that you really need to think about. They are the product of the Russian Empire. They are the product of the Soviet Union. They are for the product of the Yeltsin years. And I say that for better or for worse. I mean, that's a neutral statement, but they are who they are. They see things in geopolitical terms. The world is not flat in the former Soviet Union and the areas that surround it. I'm not sure the world is flat anywhere, but if it is, it sure as heck isn't there. Uh, they see this in very 19th century geopolitical terms. The world is not globalized. Now everything is not interdependent. Buffer zones, who owns what, those kinds of things matter in the Russian mind. Once again, maybe they're completely wrong, but that is how they see the world, and that's certainly how Putin sees the world. They have no problem in calling an enemy an enemy and a threat a threat. And we are the enemy. And they say that quite openly. And we're the ones who keep saying, no, we don't want to categorize them as that. We don't want to say that. That could escalate the situation. They see us in those terms. They see NATO in those terms. They see Georgia, Estonia, countries like that that have aligned themselves with us in those terms. Um, they see their internal opposition as an equal threat. They don't, it's not a criminal threat inside their country and an external defense threat outside their country. Enemies of the state are enemies of the state. And finally, corruption, corruption, corruption. Here's the pen diagram, Craig. Um, <laughs> brought to you directly for Craig Childress, this is the pen diagram. Uh, uh, there is what I call a unique nexus of government, uh, crime, and business. Okay, now I don't mean there's not a division of labor. There's guys who do government stuff. There's guys who do criminal stuff. There's guys who do business, licit and illicit. Okay, but these guys are all part of an inner circle. Okay, the example I try to give sometimes when we talk to a law enforcement organization is if, if you're an FBI agent and you and you uh, if one of your colleagues came to work one morning and he said, hey, you know, I was invited to this incredible dinner last night. I mean, Director Comey was there. The Vice President of the United States hosted it. Bill Gates was there. Um, and Domenico Cefalu, the head of the Gambino gang, was there. What? 
the director of the FBI was sitting at a dinner with Domenico Cefalu? I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, that stuff doesn't happen. That stuff happens in Moscow. Okay? So any of you from the law enforcement community, don't ever say the words, my counterpart in the FSB. You do not have a counterpart in the FSB. You may have a guy with a similar job title. You may have been administratively told that that's the guy with whom you have to deal if you have to deal with Russians. But believe me, you're talking to the brother of the guy who done it. Uh, there is a real, there's a real concentric circle. And law enforcement happens to people outside the circle. You violate the law and you're not on the right side of that circle, then they come after you. But if you're inside, anything goes. Let's go back a little bit of history back in the USSR. This is uh, Marshal Ogarkov, a brilliant man, was once the uh, chief of the general staff of the Soviet armed forces, wrote prolifically uh, at the end of the 70s and the early 80s, and was the guy who invented the military technical revolution. That was his term. I'm not going to do it justice. He wrote tens of thousands of pages about it. But roughly the thesis was this. The Americans with computerization, accuracy, and miniaturization are changing the battlefield. And if we don't keep up, we are going to lose. Okay, it was pretty much that simple. I mean, like I said, I'm not doing it justice. And pretty much that was true. Now, we Americans read all of his stuff, and being Americans, we took it, translated it, gave it a different name, because we couldn't use his name, called it the Revolution in Military Affairs, gave it a new acronym, the RMA, and uh, basically pick it, packaged it and spit it out the same way, and we started talking about it. And if you were in the, the, the defense consulting business back in the 90s, you'll remember the RMA, the RMA, every project that came out of the Pentagon was the RMA and, you know, add it. So, but this is where it, they started thinking about this stuff. They started thinking about cyber theory a lot earlier than we did. Okay, a lot of things that I'm going to show you in a moment. They resolved back in the 90s some of the things that we're still thinking about. This is Colonel Vitaly Tsimbal. Uh, he was quite active in the 1990s on the lecture circuit. And a lot of what we know, we know because Colonel Tsimbal was quite candid about how the then Russians saw things. Uh, and here's his list of this is all information warfare. This stuff all goes together, and they don't make a different a differentiation in that. These are just different tools. So how does that translate? Mid-90s, mid-90s statements here, Colonel Simba. Is it warfare? We're still debating that. Is it an act of war? Is it not an act of war? What if they do it to us? What if we do it to them? What's an act of war? What's it? That's still being debated. Resolved in the 1990s in Russia. It's already, yes, it's an act of war. We do it, we understand it's an act of war, and if you do it to us, make no mistake, we will retaliate however we think we need to, including the use of nuclear weapons. It is an act of war. Um, you go to General Samsonov, who was roughly at the same time the, uh, the acting uh, chief of staff in uh, the 1990s. Uh, look what he's talking about, information warfare, and look at that bottom quote in red there. To disorganize a state so that you may be able to replace kinetic weapons. Some of the things we are talking about today, so what we saw them try to do in Georgia in 2008, theoretically, they were talking about this back in the mid-90s. And if you think I'm just giving you history, this is an excerpt from their current military doctrine that was published in 2010. Uh, here you go. The implementation of measures of information warfare to substitute, and you know, let's face it, we're not talking about completely substitute, but the notion that you can substitute certain functions that you used to use kinetic weapons for. Well, the Russians are really good at theory. Uh, where the Russians tend to fall down is practice. Uh, they're not good engineers, they're not good planners. Uh, a lot of the stuff they write, uh, then kind of uh, the, moment, the moment the first shot is fired, uh, it kind of goes off and, and there you go. Big wake up call. Uh, the first Gulf War, it terrified them because what General, uh, uh, Marshal Ogarkov had been talking about, they saw pretty much on the side of the United States. That's what happened. Jim Vandeveld's here with us. He used to be on our delegation to the Defense and Space Talks, and I'll, he will remember the gentleman about whom I speak, uh, General Nikolai Detinov, one of their top military engineers. We really didn't have a heck of a lot other to do in the Defense and Space Talks, so a lot of small talk and what's going on in the newspapers uh, happened. I remember one morning, General Zatinov came in with the news, and he was literally shaking. I mean, you could see him shaking. What's going on in, in Iraq? And I said, yeah, your stuff's not working real well, is it, General? 
And he said, well, they don't know how to use it. They're, 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 these Iraqis are stupid. I said, well, it's your training. You guys trained them. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. And he said, well, they're, they're so stupid, they don't even turn on the radar. He said, they don't turn on the radar, General, because every time they turn on the radar, they get tubed about 20 seconds later. <laughs> they're not as dumb as you think they are. Um, but they were terrified. And if you read their military literature, they were absolutely terrified at what happened in the first Gulf War. Uh, then they had their own internal wake-ups, the first Chechen war. The Chechens waxed them on the information warfare. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a moment. But the Chechens basically seized the initiative, understood what the technology, remember we're talking about early, early days of internet here, but the, basically they got themselves out there and started doing things. And then a little bit, a little more even-handed in the second Chechen war. Uh, that helicopter that I have there in the background uh, is an MI-26, the largest helicopter in the inter their inventory. One instance, um, the uh, Chechens brought it down. Uh, they put that out. The Russians denied it. That picture was all over within 24 hours. Remember where we're talking about. We're in, we're in, the, in the early 90s. 24 hours was, 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 was real time back then. Um, they were raising money. They had a bank account in California. You want to send us money? You can send us money. They were selling CDs. CD, selling CDs brings in money. Remember, back when we are, the, amount, the ability to send large, large packets of data wasn't there. So what did you do? New York Times wants to buy a CD. You send it by FedEx. And 24 hours later, they've got a CD with all those pictures of what's going on in Chechnya. Uh, they reached out to every jihadi around the world. Now, that's good and it's bad. They got themselves infiltrated by those guys, but they also got a lot of money and a lot of external support by using the tools that they had available. Well, this did not escape the notice of the Russians. And remember, what is the major product of the Second Chechen War? The major product of the Second Chechen War is Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He comes to power as a result of the Second Chechen War. And this is a comment about cyber. We surrendered that. We understand we were losing. And it ain't going to happen anymore. We're taking this back. That was a statement in 1999, and that's exactly what he started doing. Now, there's kind of an enigma uh, with cyber and Putin. Because on the one hand, we get these stories of a guy who can't operate a smartphone, doesn't use a computer, and has people always with him around him to do those things for him. So he appears to be an atechnical guy. And yet he at least appears to understand the theory of how this stuff is really important. That's weird, but it's the reality. And if you look at his political statements, never mind whether he can use the smartphone, maybe he told another guy, make this call. But here's what started happening. He starts taking charge of cyber policy. There's two things, though, before we go on about Vladimir Putin you've got to remember. First of all, he's KGB. And when you're KGB, you are always KGB. It's not a service in which you once served. The KGB is a way of thinking, and he's got it. Secondly, he is a brilliant geopolitical thinker. You may think he's wrong. You may think it's out of place in the 21st century. But he sees the world in geopolitical terms. And he said the greatest disaster of the 20th century was the fall of the Soviet Union is replacing, not Soviet Union, but Russian Empire now. So what do we see? Well, there had been a 1995 law back from the Yeltsin years that at least made an attempt, and I'm not going to tell you this was some great stroke of democracy, but it was at least an attempt to say, look, there's a limited number of people who are allowed to do electronic surveillance, and those people need to go to get a, to a court and get some kind of a piece of paper. Now, like I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that what they needed to do was what a, a, an FBI agent needs to do in the United States to get a court order or, 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 or an MI5 agent in Britain or something like that. But at least it was an attempt in that direction. Never mind, don't spend a lot of time on it. January 2000, 2000 literally, as he came to office, uh, that was all changed. And anybody with a gun and a badge, uh, including the Kremlin security, uh, can basically, without a court order, carry out electronic surveillance. Uh, within eight months, uh, he ha publishes the information doctrine of the Russian Federation. Take a look at those bottom three bullets. Now, the first one is something you would recognize in just about any country in the United States, in Britain, in France, you would see something like that. We want to protect our stuff. Perfectly normal. Take a look at both the second and the third bullets. We need to protect 
against deleterious foreign information. That's us, guys. We need to protect our people. Their concept of security is not we need to protect our systems, we need to protect our networks. We also need to protect our country against bad stuff that's coming in. And there's a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> I'd be the first to tell you. But, but we wouldn't think in those terms. And then, here we go, back to the USSR. Look at the third bullet. And we have to train the great Narod to make sure that they properly understand that deleterious information. This is something that would never, ever be said by an American politician, an American policy document. Um, talk about a little bit about organization. Once again, sort of what happened. Well, there was an organization called FOPSI. I'm not going to tell you. FOPSI was a great uh, paragon of democracy either. But it was Gorbachev's attempt to pull some of the power out of the KGB and put this electronic stuff under another organization. And this is sort of what Fopsy did. Don't spend a lot of time worrying about what Fopsy did because, once again, Vladimir Putin by 2003 does away with Fopsy and reorganizes everything. Most of the power, the lion's share of the electronic stuff goes back to the KGB, now called the FSB. Uh, a little bit to the internal security organization, the FSO. And then if you see in the upper right-hand corner, I have the MVDK. That's the interior ministry. These are cyber cops, basically. If you're on the wrong side of those circles that I talked about and you violate the law, these are the guys who come looking for you. It's MVDK. They wouldn't dare if you were on the right side of the law. I'll give you one example. There's some poor guy who ran a sport sporting goods store in St. Petersburg. And he got fed up with the corruption, and he, he hacked in to the uh, St. Petersburg D Dinamo, uh, Dinamo? I can't remember it's Dinamo. Anyway, one locomotive, one of the one locom locomotive football team, which is the three-time uh, Russian champion in, uh, in, in football or soccer, what we call. Um, so a good platform, you know, it's, it's, it's drawing people. And he says, you know, he had a picture of a building that had just been sold and pictures of the local governor and the speaker of the still called Soviet, by the way, uh, and still called Leningrad. Uh, the Leningrad Soviet, and said, you know, there's corruption, these people are destroying our city, da 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 da. MVDK swooped in within 24 hours, and he's never been heard from again. Okay, so if you're on the wrong side, believe me, they're really good at figuring out. When the FBI goes over and says, gee, we have this evidence on this, eh, they can't find anything then if, they, if you need help. But if they need to do something, they move very quickly. Okay, you may notice down in the lower right-hand corner, I've got a, a, a couple of things in, in dotted lines and kind of faded out. They're in dotted lines because they're really parastatal. But I think in a country like Russia, you have to include some of the parastatal organizations, like criminal organizations, Russian Business Network, like youth groups, NASHI, um, because they're used regularly by the Kremlin for state business. Okay, so it's very good uh, for attribution. It's hard to figure out who did it, but these guys are part of the state cyber apparat. That's why I put the dotted lines. Okay, why did I fade them out? Well, because they both kind of disappeared. Um, the, the, the Nashi organization kind of became a problem because there was a change of the guard inside the presidential administration. I won't get into too much detail. We can talk about it later if you want. But basically, there were political reasons why these guys need to be pushed away. And Katuna is going to tell you a little bit in a moment about how, what we think has happened with their cyber capabilities sort of being brought back. Russian Business Network, same thing. Uh, the, the, the criminal organization, QUA criminal organization, appears to have evaporated. The people, and guess what? The IP addresses, the autonomous systems, everything they were operating through did not disappear. And we've seen them just recently in Georgia. And we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, Internet monitoring, you know, never mind what, uh, what uh, Edward Snowden tells you the NSA is doing, it's child's play, okay? Uh, these guys are looking at every single communication that goes through the RUNET. Uh, and SORM3 is a very advanced capability. It does not just uh, computer stuff. It basically looking at all electronic stuff, and it has a storage capability. If they want to go back and look, and it was supersized for the Olympics. So um, there was, the, you know, make no mistake, if you think there's no difference, there's a big difference in what we do and what they do. They're going through everything. 
So with that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the other things they're doing in the FSB. And I will turn this over to my colleague, Khatuna Mishvidobadze, to uh, talk to you a little bit about this. <coughs> okay, as David mentioned, that's mostly the um, uh, cybersecurity is, uh, uh, FSB is in charge of the cybersecurity in Russia. So uh, in 2013, there was a presidential order that assigns actually the whole, you know, um, to FSB the, to be in charge of the critical um, infrastructure uh, protection in Russia. So there was a, the, you know, the statement about the cert, uh, in, um, creation of the cert-like organization, installation of security sy system, and especially uh, industrial control system. So what is very interesting here, so right after uh, this order was issued, uh, in a couple of days, um, on a Kaspersky Lab website, uh, they announced that they're, they're seeking the professionals of the SCADA system and in the industrial control system. So it's kind of the give us um, uh, some hints about um, the Kaspersky's relationship with the security services of Russia. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, military um, cyber capabilities. So it is kind of the uncertain. We know that there was a study conducted uh, right after the 2008 um, uh, war against Georgia. That was actually the first combined um, kinetic and uh, cyber war. Uh, there was a <coughs> negative evaluation. Uh, January tw 2012, Nikolai Makarov reported about to reported that they prepare for the cyber, you know, um, cyber war, uh, they have to prepare in, in this regard. There was a different statements for the very high level Russian government representative uh, on creation of the cyber command. Uh, and um, there are uh, some, um, actually a year ago there was a um, Kaspersky, if I'm not mistaken, he was uh, um, invited to, to speak in a, um, Georgetown University, and he made a quite interesting statement about this, that, um, uh, that Russia didn't confirm that they have the military cyber division, but I know that they do. Actually, there are some, um, you know, um, that uh, people are talking, there are some, um, how to say, um, uh, that um, Russian military capability uh, is uh, developing in the radio technical troops or in the general staff. So this is what, what is, you know, actually out there on the RUNET if you really um, uh, search in this direction. So people, um, and, or in, and even on social media, people are talking about this. Um, and uh, it's very interesting that also the, um, uh, in uh, August 2012, uh, 13, there was a um, uh, Minister of um, uh, Defense of Russia, they announced the tender that they were seeking the uh, cybersecurity professional. Um, and uh, they actually were welcoming the uh, high um, school students as well to apply this tender. So cyber espionage here is the actually, uh, we all know that Russia uh, um, conducts the cyber, uh, strategic cyber espionage uh, against many, you know, advanced countries and especially against the United States. And um, here is the uh, United States National Counterintelligence Executive that was uh, um, published so in October 2011 and here what we see that Russians are not only using human, human internal intelligence, but also the uh, cyber and other operation to collect economic information and technology to support Russia's economic development and security. And if we, for example, look very carefully to their military doctrine or um, uh, national security strategy, this is what is identified there and what is reflected actually there. So. Uh, benefits of subcontracting of criminals in the youth group. So you know that in 2007 there was the attack against Estonia and 2008 combined kinetic and cyber attack against Georgia. So several players were there. So like uh, subnational groups like uh, Russian Business Network, now she were behind this attack. And we uh, heard that uh, it was right after the 2007 attack against, uh, cyber attack against <laughs> Estonia, uh, Nashi Commissar Nikolai Goloskakov openly said to a financial time uh, that he and 
his friends were behind this attack. And any time any country dare to do something that they don't like and that's going to hurt their Rodina, so we're going we're gonna to do this again. That was an open statement. Now, in some cases, we're kind of don't even hide that they're using uh, subcontracting criminals um, uh, and youth group like uh, Nashi and uh, Russian Business Network that actually um, uh, this, um, evaporated from Ethernet right after the 2008 uh, uh, cyber attack against Georgia. So I'm lately going to talk uh, more about this. So what's happened about Nashi? Uh, here is a picture. Here is a uh, Christina Potomchik is a Kremlin internal project chief. So Nashi was kind of the reorganized. So those crazy facts that we are using, you, that we were using for uh, street actions. So those guys were, you know, kind of the pushed away. So those guys who were very clever and uh, have a computer skills and cybersecurity skills. So those guys were kept. And who is in charge of new kind of the Nashi, that's why we call them, call them in a different <coughs> name, Christina Potomchuk, was a, that, that she was a, one of the leading and major player in Nashi before. So why we're doing this, you know, can, that can, can found attribution, uh, uh, and this is a super cost effective them them, uh, for, for them, and it benefits from commercializ commercialization, specialization, and expertise at the same time. So next. So Russian Business Network, as I mentioned, that's they evaporated from that from that light right after the 2008, closely were linked to the S domain, uh, decertified by ICANN in October um, 2008. But there are some indication that uh, principles have resurfaced in a similar activities uh, in Russia, Ukraine, and China. What's um, very interesting that um, I mentioned the strategic espionage. So Russia uses its cyber capabilities, not only as such a very advanced country like the United States, for example, they use those uh, strategic um, espionage against Georgia. So 2011 and 2012, uh, there was a big cyber espionage campaign against Georgia. And uh, Georgian CERT did a very good job. They reverse engineered. Um, all the process and uh, they identified this uh, virus and actually who was behind uh, this attack actually I mean uh, um, indication where was that the uh, it's kind of the Russian business network the same IP address the same autonomous system and the may reverse engineers the process also we they um, um, you know the uh, they identified who the guy who was actually behind this and address uh, where this guy was locating. It, uh, it was identified that the, the, you know that was the Lubyanka uh, 13, and most of uh, you know uh, which organization is located uh, in this area. So uh, there are a lot of tools of uh, cyber crime for sale in, in in Russia. If you go to the websites like anti chat you know, hacker, whatever, there are many of those kind of, you know, websites. You can buy or rent botnets or exploits, and uh, this is all available. Actually, what's very uh, interesting that, um, uh, you know, a lot of talents uh, after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union because of the and it was a very uh, difficult time socially and economically. So many of those guys uh, who had a you know, uh, capability in this regard, you know, they, some of them went to a legitimate business, but some of them went to a, um, then to a cyber crime uh, business. So uh, that's... Um, and uh, Estonia, there was a, uh, as I um, mentioned, that there was a uh, cyber attack in Estonia in 2007. That was what was the motivation that uh, all of the shenanigans start. So when the, the uh, Estonian government decided to relocate the uh, Soviet, uh, mm, uh, you know, memorial of the Soviet soldier from the city center to a military cemetery, 
uh, um, Nashi, the youth group, uh, Kremlin youth group, uh, you know, started to, to use the Russian national Estonians uh, um, uh, to participate in these rallies and demonstrations. So, and then they made a big deal and, um, and big problems inside Tallinn. So there was a two-phase uh, so kind of the uh, attack. It started April 27 and it uh, continued until the May 3rd. Uh, there was a kind of a pink flooding, uh, flooding DOS attack on the, but then the second phase that was a more massive cyber attack actually started May 8th, that's con uh, that was, uh, you know, from May to May 18th. That was a defacement, uh, distribution in all service attack, multiple botnets were, were used and um, uh, that caused uh, a lot of problems economically for the uh, Estonian government because the uh, uh, dependent of, of, of the internet technology in, in Estonia at that time was very high. It was at about 45, 50%. Uh, so, and then in 2008, there was a Georgia's turn. Uh, turn. Um, uh, it was, as I mentioned, the first ever combined kinetic and cyber attack. All the preparation and testing actually was done before, uh, before the war. And there was a early July, the distribution denial of service attack. We were actually testing the servers because you have to test the servers and you have to, uh, have to know in advance, you know, if you prepare for such attack, how many, you know, what kind of capacity server has and, uh, um, there was defacement, uh, well, they actually defaced the, uh, the Georgian president's uh, website, um, depicting him as Hitler, um, and internet blockade. So before actually all the uh, internet traffic um, was uh, going through Russia. So right after the, after the war, uh, so there was a new project, and uh, in a couple of years, we actually, uh, there was two um, fiber optic ca cable built from uh, Poti uh, uh, to Varna. Poti is the one of the city of the Georgia, and the, so now the 90% of the internet traffic goes to this road. Um, and, um, and then right after the war in uh, August 2007, there was a, another DDoS attack. So here, pictured here is uh, all of the list of uh, um, actually uh, all of those sites that uh, uh, Russians wanted to target. So uh, two uh, websites uh, were created, uh, like a Stop Georgia or Stop Georgia Info, and they they put there all the you know instructions how to you know and calling for the patriotic youngsters to help them uh, in in this attack. So and here is the sites actually mostly the you know government sites, new media, and um, uh, those kind of organizations. Uh, and um, so what's very interesting here that Russia treats its uh, external neighbors and uh, internal neighbors at the same time. So, uh, same way, I'm sorry. Uh, so pictured here is that several times, uh, and uh, now by, you know, it's very frequently happens that they attack the opposition websites. Uh, and um, for example, in 2011, there was a DDoS attack. Navalny, Alexei, uh, Alexei uh, Navalny, who's the anti-corruption crusader, one of the very, uh, popular political lead leader who actually is perceived as the um, real rivalry to Putin. So that's why he, this uh, Putin and you know his circle is very much afraid of those guys because you know he gained this popularity uh, through his blog sites and through social media in Russia. That's uh, I would like to mention that social media is became a fifth state in Russia and. Uh, then later on, I'm gonna um, talk a little bit what kind of steps Russian governments are uh, taking to kind of the suppress um, and social media in Russia. So because these figures like Navalny are uh, evolving. Uh, so pictured here is the Karta Narushenya. This is the map of violation. The, there was uh, uh, run, this project was run by one of the um, uh, non-governmental organization in Russia that actually 
like these red blotches here shows uh, showed the, all of the uh, violations uh, by regions um, in Russia during the Duma election. And all of us know that's what's really happened. Uh, and that was all circulated uh, in, in social media. And that was the first time, actually, right after the Duma election, that a lot of rallies and demonstrations of many people, you know, thousands of people were in the street of Moscow uh, and opposing uh, um, uh, against uh, this viol election violations. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, this site was um, uh, shut down, and not only these south sites, many of the uh, block sites, uh, uh, websites that were opposing the, um, you know, was dedicated to um, um, against uh, there was dedicated against the uh, Russian government was shut shut down. Uh, we. It just, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So here is the letter that was sent to a Pavel Durov. Pavel Durov was uh, a director of the Kontakte. Kontakte is the most famous uh, social platform in, in Russia. It's like a social uh, um, social media platform in, in Russia. It's uh, like a Facebook so popular that is even, I mean, uh, in Russia they call it like, like a fa Facebook scheme. It's very much like Facebook. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, online groups, uh, political groups, you know, there. And um, so uh, during the Duma election, actually right after the Duma election, uh, this is the letter from FSB that was sent to um, Pavel Durov. So what is written here that, you know, they are asking him, requesting actually from him to shut down all the political groups in a contact. And he actually said, no, I'm not going to do this. And he just, you know, scanned this letter and, uh, you know, put it on the internet. And this is actually was the, and later on what's, ha what's really happened with Durov, uh, it's, uh, uh, it was uh, later on what's happened to Rov that, you know, uh, now Durov is uh, uh, not in Russia. He, he left the country, and he's not anymore the director of that. He doesn't own anything, actually, in uh, in uh, uh, contact. And um, the Shir was completely bought by two Russian oligarchs that is very close in Putin's inner circle. And the Russian most famous social media platform now is completely, completely controlled by FSB. So uh, actually what's really happened during the Duma election, the so-called patriotic hackers uh, were also very effective and they kind of, the, you know, uh, were, um, and we all know who were behind them. This is not very hard to find, you know, uh, figure out because if you know how Russia works, you know, you know how you know they um, they uh, arrange the things. And they were so-called patriotic hackers attacking those very uh, opposition uh, social opposition websites. But it's kind of strange that in, uh, in uh, during the presidential election that was after several months. Those patriotic hackers just, you know, didn't do anything. So nothing happened actually in, a, in, a, in, in, in terms of the cyber oppression. So it gives us a kind of the, you know, suspicious about <coughs> this and to, that someone was orchestrating, someone was giving direction, the directives to them where to stop and uh, where, where to proceed. Uh, and uh, what's really important is right after the elections, in 2012, so uh, the, the uh, Russian Duma adopted a new law that's called actually the protection of children and illegal, and banning the illegal content on internet. I mean, no one argues about this. Uh, protection of children is very good, but what they are doing, they are using this law against their political uh, opponent, like for example, Alexei Navalny. Here is a statement of Alexei Navalny that says that they want to create blacklist. 
then ISP will block a, a particular site without trial simply on the orders of the ministry. They actually several times blocked the Navalny's, um, uh, blacklisted Navalny's um, uh, blog site and his account uh, in uh, Live Journal. That is the one of the famous uh, blog sites uh, in, um, in uh, Russia. So, Pavel Durov, he doesn't own anything. He is uh, actually, he was one of the creators of the, uh, of the contact uh, in Russia, but you know, now he f fired. And plus, I mean, he's just left the country because this is what happens with the guys that, you know, uh, does not agree with the um, uh, government policy of uh, Russia. So what's happening, what is happening with uh, Navalny? So poor guy, he was uh, convicted of embezzlement. Um, uh, then this, you know, convicted for, for imprisonment for five years. Then it was, you know, the sentence was suspended. Then he was in house arrest. And, I mean, and then again in house arrest, another conviction. It's kind of the, all of the shenanigans that's going on against Navalny because Navalny is a real threat uh, for, uh, for Kremlin and in particular for Putin. So those kind of things is going, I mean, actually we want to kind of, we don't know what to do with this guy. So we know that Navalny is a big threat, but you know, we don't want to do obvious thing. So you know, step by step, you know, we're accusing this guy and finding, you know, some kind of the, you know, uh, creating some kind of the story about uh, him and um, uh, so, and why am I, what's, and here comes actually Ukraine, uh, a lot of cyber, um, uh, shenanigans and development was going on, and David actually will uh, brief, uh, briefly talk about the side of the conflict that was going on. Thank you, Katuna. This is kind of a little bit of a briefing within a briefing, but uh, it's sort of excerpted from a, a larger one that we have on, on Ukraine. Uh, but I think it's important to talk a little bit about what's going on right now, because this really is the current news, along with the Pavel Durov thing that Katuna just told you about, uh, basically there is no social media in Russia that is not controlled by the Kremlin now. Uh, here we see um, just a couple of images. That's Uroboros up there, the uh, snake that eats its own tail, thereby regenerating life. It was not invented by the Russians, although its electronic form was, uh, but it, this is uh, something that goes back to actually Egyptian and Greek mythology, uh, and it'll come out in a moment. A very connected country, Ukraine. Uh, here you see an Euro Maidan, uh, which was Maidan is a big, huge square in front of the Ukrainian parliament in Kiev, um, where the demonstrations took place. Remember, what sparked those demonstrations was uh, President Yanukovych's refusal to sign the European Union Association Agreement. Uh, that you know, everybody says, well, that's just a piece of paper. That really brought people into the streets. And it was a symbol, of course. It was a symbol of, is the country moving to the west or is the country moving to the east? That's what brought people out, and it became Aerol Maidan. So you see two people checking news there on a, on a, on a laptop in Aerol Maidan, and that's one of the so-called little green men that started appearing. Notice how new those uniforms are, by the way, uh, with no patches or anything on them. By the way, another thing, if you watch uh, Russian armed forces, you will notice, for example, most of the forces that invaded Georgia in 2008 were typical Russian soldiers, uh, slovenly, not particularly good shape, dirty uniforms, unshaved, uh, pretty, pretty nasty looking army, something General Reese would absolutely never accept for more than like 10 seconds. Um, look at this guy. The guys that showed up in Crimea were tall, good looking, uh, in shape, this is Spetsnaz. These guys are special forces. Uh, it's very clear watching them, looking at their weapons, looking at their equipment, the new uniforms. It's very clear who these guys are. Um, and that's Simferopol Airport, by the way, in the background. Did I just? Yeah, OK. So um, I think I've gone a step too far here. Well, we've gone. Now I've really done something. All right. Go back to slideshow. 
Okay, this is a lesson. You can't drop the thing <laughs> that, uh, I'm gonna do this. can we go back, Katuna? Okay, never mind. okay, there we go. All right. There was a lot of stuff in the press, if you remember, right about the time, I think it was February 22nd, so let's just take that as the benchmark date. February 22nd, Yanukovych fled Kiev, uh, went first to Kharkiv, and then turned up in Russia, and there's been some reports he may be back, we don't know. But um, let's take that sort of as the date, and all of a sudden cyber stuff started happening, and I'm being very careful not to call it cyber war, because I think there was a little bit of a misnomer that came out in the press. Certainly, Dave Smith did not say there was no cyber going on. There was lots of cyber thing, but let's leave it at cyber stuff for a moment, okay? Um, one of the first that came, that came out was Ouroboros, Snake, Turla, all roughly the same thing. The best we can figure out, Snake appears to be the program, Ur, um, Ouroboros appears to be the 64-bit version, and, and Turla appears to be the 32-bit version, with roughly the same, uh, the same thing, though. Um, this came out uh, as sort of, you see, this is one of the attacks that's going on on Ukraine. Well, hang on a minute. It's happening, and I'm not excusing it, but it's an espionage program that had been happening for several years. There was a little German company that had been doing research on it, and when this all hit the news, they hurried up, got their report out, and issued it. Can't blame them. You might as well try and find it to see if you can make a euro out of the deal. Uh, but, but basically, and the pe press picked it up as, you see, this is one of the attacks on Ukraine. This, in fact, was a long-standing cyber espionage uh, attack on Ukraine, as there are in other neighbors. Um, interestingly, as uh, this thing is that people have gone back through this, Snake, Uroboros, Turla, all roughly the same thing, uh, a similarity was found with Agent BTZ. Agent BTZ, of course, was the vector that was used to attack the United States and resulted in the largest cleanup operation in history called Buckshot Yankee. Uh, so there's apparently some similarities in the code there. And then you may remember about a year ago, there was another thing that Kaspersky announced called Red October, which appeared to be, uh, well, I mean, they can't help themselves, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, which appeared to be uh, uh, an espionage vector that was directed against uh, diplomatic uh, posts, mostly in Eastern Europe. Now, Kaspersky actually went so far as to say that it was probably some kind of a Russian security organization, which tells me there was some kind of internecine fighting going on among the security agencies that they would dare say that. Uh, so apparently there's some, uh, some stylistic, uh, some bits of code that are similar with Agent BTZ, Snake, and Red October. Um, if you see the blue in the pie graph there, that's, you can see most of it was, it was, was uh, uh, directed against Ukraine. That thing that's about one quarter of a pie that's sort of an off red color is Lithuania. Uh, we actually had the privilege of presenting this in Lithuania a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they were very interested in that, of course. The reason I put uh, Jirobot, Katuna mentioned this uh, cyber espionage uh, campaign against Georgia uh, is I'm trying to put this in a context. This was not an attack that happened on Ukraine in January, February of 2014. This was a long-standing uh, cyber espionage campaign against Ukraine. And I think by putting it in the context, putting it next to Jirobot, what I'm trying to tell you is it's a long-standing cyber espionage campaign against all of Russia's neighbors, okay? At about the same time, Jirobot is circulating around Georgia. If you see that little, the big blue portion, 70%, mostly Georgian uh, nodes that were, uh, that were infected. It was a drive-by, uh, basically a, a strategic website attack. They infected uh, new sites that would be liable to be frequented by professional people. And there was a set of keywords, both in English and in Georgian, uh, that had to do with security things. So things like um, NATO, FBI, CIA, NSA, Major Colonel, General Tank, uh, in both languages. So if you went to get football scores, you didn't get infected. Uh, if you put Tbilisi Dinamo or something in, uh, you, didn't, you didn't get infected. If you put FBI, Snowden, probably not Snowden at the time, but NSA or something like that, if you got one of those, it dropped the Trojan into your, into your computer. 
Uh, this was uncovered by the Georgian CERT, uh, working with the FBI, uh, with the security services of several other Western countries, and ESET and some other of the, the security companies. Uh, they managed to eradicate the thing, gave instructions out to people who had been infected, and they actually struck back. They, they created a honeypot document uh, that they called very cleverly Georgia-NATO Agreement. Stayed up nights thinking of that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, and, uh, and infected it. And sure enough, it got stolen because it had the right keywords, sent back to uh, command and control uh, ser server. And the guy on the other end, of course, got cocky, made a mistake, didn't put it in a sandbox, opened it up right in front of his own camera. That's him. We know who he is. We know his associations, uh, both with, other, with Russian hackers, German hackers, and with the FSB. Uh, so that was part of what started happening, what we saw. Will we? Oh, okay, I'll just keep your hands off it. Got it. Got it. So what did we actually see at the time going on uh, in, in, in Ukraine? Um, well, first of all, remember, we have a change in government, so when we say the Ukrainian government, there was the Yuka Yanukovych government, then there's the new interim government. So first thing we saw was uh, presumably Western-oriented Ukrainian hackers attacking the Yanukovych government. Very quickly, we had the opposite. Any site that had been covering Aeromaidan favorably got attacked, presumably by hackers on the other side. Uh, then we got this, and this has got the reason I throw this in is to try and I'm trying to deconstruct this of what appeared in the press. The next thing that appeared was Plotus Trojan, was, as part of this. That's sort of the part that came out in the press. Well, Plotus is uh, it's a banking Trojan. It it, it 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 attacks ATM machines. It's kind of cool. Uh, it, it attaches itself to the uh, to the hard drive of the of the ATM, and you have to have a guy in place, and you can go basically withdraw all the money that's in the little cylinder uh, inside the ATM. Uh, I suspect these are just genuine criminals. Good moment, lots of confusion, lots of cyber stuff going on. This is a good moment to clean out a few ATMs. I suspect this is not Russians or whatever, but that happened and was reported. Then we had a bunch of stuff where I had reported, uh, oh, excuse me, use of social media, a lot of stuff happening to recruit and to inform on both sides. Then we have a lot of what I would call physical stuff. Uh, it was also reported in the press as cyber attacks. Um, Installation of hardware. Remember, the Russians pretty much owned the Ukrainian uh, telecommunications network, so it wasn't real hard to, to do this. But apparently, they had some so, some uh, some hardware uh, installed in the cell phone uh, apparatus, and they were literally misdirecting calls of certain uh, Ukrainian politicians. Uh, there was jamming from Russian Navy ships. Now, remember, the Russians would say, "See, information warfare." Americans said, well, wait, wait a minute, that, that, that's jamming, that's not, that's not, that, that's different, that's, that's different from cyber warfare. Press reported it as cyber warfare, uh, Russian ships basically jamming radio frequencies. And then physical damage, literally guys walking into telecommunications facilities and into the uh, Simferopol IXP and smashing things with sledgehammers. Is that a cyber attack? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you walk in, you, you look at a server, you smash it with a sledgehammer, it won't work. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's a cyber attack. I don't know. But that all got presented that way. Beat you to it. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, and in this continuing campaign, uh, a bunch of the uh, Russian propaganda sites, particularly Russia Today. Russia Today is putting out some very vicious stuff. They're taken down. Then, as uh, Khatuna mentioned, had happened during the... Um, uh, internal in the Duma elections in uh, in Russia, same thing. They tried to take down any opposition page on Kontakte. Uh, now, what you've got going on here, a little different from the Georgian War, is you're all of a sudden getting an opposition inside Russia. I don't want to think we want to call them pro-Ukrainian, but what you're getting is sort of Russian-minded, you know, Russian liberal-minded, democratic-minded probably people who kind of like Navalny, starting to say, well, what are we doing here? What are we doing to our country? We invaded Georgia, now we're invading Ukraine. Uh, we're getting isolated from the rest of the world. It's all, by the way, true. Um, but anyway, they wanted to bring that down. Uh, so they brought that down. 
Um, then, so Kontaku is getting pressured. As Katuna told you, what did they do? They, they had warned Duroff about six months ago. They'd been buying up the shares. He still had 12 percent. Uh, and there was a board of directors motion to, re to remove him, and he just barely survived. I mean, it was very clear. Phone calls had been made, scare him, but don't remove him. Well, this time, guess what they did? They actually they removed him, and he has fled the country. Uh, they're probably a smart man, yeah. Uh, then a, a, an organization called Kiber Berkut. Berkut is the riot police uh, of the Yanukovych government. So these guys sort of seized on Berkut and called themselves Cyber Berkut, Kiber Berkut. Claims to have taken down three NATO websites. Now, I can't tell you that Kiber Berkut took down three we NATO websites. I can tell you for the 72-hour period during which they claimed they had brought them down, those sites were down. So that much I can tell you. Uh, there you see them. Now, put in red what was the only, in my view, because different from, from the Georgian thing, what appeared to be strategic strikes, not just hackers doing tit for tat. One was during that three-day period, the weekend, when um, the Russian forces moved out of their bases in Crimea. Remember, it was kind of a weird invasion because they were already there. They kind of opened the gates and walked out onto the street. Um, the, there were massive attacks against Ukrainian government sites, basically preventing them from getting information out. So that appears to have been a strategic strike. And then again, a few weeks later, during the so-called referendum on Crimea joining Russia, same thing happened. Site, uh, 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 Ukrainian government sites are taken down to prevent communication. And here's another interesting thing, though. A lot of tit for tat. OK, you hit me. Ukraine's a pretty well-connected place uh, with a lot of guys who, by the way, probably make a living working with Russian cyber criminals. Uh, in their day jobs, um, but look at look at this. There are more. There's more tit for tat attacks going back on Russia than there were Russian on Ukraine. And one one attack, 124 gigabytes per second for 18 minutes. That's a massive DDoS attack. Uh, as far as I know, the largest one, that at least, has been publicly discussed, was a couple of years ago in Europe. There was kind of a little DDoS war going on, and that reached uh, 300 gigabytes per second. Uh, a few years ago, I would have said, you know, shows you it's got to be nation state. The reality is if you read the literature on DDoS attacks, the capabilities that are going into criminal organizations are really formidable. And, and, and a, a, an average now, over half of the known DDoS attacks are over 20 gigabytes per second. So it is not inconceivable that this is a very well endowed, very well organized criminal organization. It's also not inconceivable there's a government involved somewhere, but, 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 but we just don't know. And just finally here, just to show you the importance the Russians place on this kind of stuff, we've got this back and forth, back and forth going on uh, with the hackers. But here you have the government. You have the, 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 the prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, publicly saying how important it is to get Ross Telecom into Crimea. Why? Because Crimea is a peninsula. In fact, it's almost an island, because that northern part, that, it, there's a lot of water there. There's really only two causeways that lead from mainland Ukraine into Crimea. Their water, their gas, uh, their electricity comes across those causeways, uh, as does any road traffic or rail traffic. Guess what else comes through there? Fiber optic cable. Okay. What Medvedev is talking about is that's dangerous, because if you see these little things here, these little blue marker things, um, those are the IXPs in Ukraine. There's six IXPs in Ukraine. Another difference with Georgia. There's no IXP to this day in Georgia. Uh, six IXPs in, uh, in Ukraine. One of them's at Simferopol, uh, so five of them in mainland Ukraine. And so their fiber optic cable, uh, all their internet communication is coming from one of those five IXPs down through that fiber optic cable. This is up at the top. We're talking about the number two guy in the country saying, no, 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 we can't allow that. Just like the electricity and the, and the water, we can't become dependent. So there's now Ross Telecom is putting, if you see that bottom arrow across the Kerch Peninsula, fiber optic cable so that uh, in a few weeks, the internet traffic that's traveling in and out of Crimea will go across fiber optic cable into mainland Russia. Uh, and will go either through the Stavropol or the Rostov uh, IXPs. Uh, so I mean, this is really at the top level. 
So here's what we have not seen, though. As Khatuna was telling you, that they had the Russians had prepared this incredible, um, well, uh, well reconned, well mapped out campaign against Georgia. Um, they were recruiting these hackers, whether they were paid through criminal organizations, paid through Nashi, or just recruiting uh, script kiddies. They pe they put a lot of time into that. We didn't see the pre-recruitment. Of, of, of hackers. We didn't see the youth groups this time. We didn't see systematic. That's why I put those two things in red. We saw a little bit of it. We didn't see systematic and enduring attacks on Ukrainian critical infrastructure. We, by the way, didn't see systematic and enduring attacks on, on kinetic attacks on Ukrainian uh, infrastructure. And that part of it goes back to my point, what arrow do you take out of the quiver? And I'll offer you an, an answer in a moment. We didn't see an internet blockade that we saw in Georgia. Uh, so there were some similarities. Okay, what happened? A lot of cyber stuff. It was not like Georgia. Uh, it was more of an information war than a cyber war in which certain cyber aspects came to the fore. Clearly, there's youth groups, there's, there's criminal groups, the hacktivists, that's clearly going on there. But what was limiting it? Why was it different? Well, first of all, I think they had short prep time. Do the Russians have a strategy to, uh, to uh, recreate the Russian Empire? Yes, I think they do. Do the Russians have a deep, deep attachment to not only this buffer zone, but this great Slavic area of Ukraine? Yes, I think they do. Were they thinking for years about annexing Crimea? Yes, I think they were. Do they have a blueprint where they said, okay, it's February 22nd, Yanukovych, you're out. European guys, you're in. We're gonna move tanks over, the, that, that, come on. They're not that, well, they're not that organized. They took advantage of a situation. They had a big grand strategy and they started implementing it. They didn't have the time, for one thing, to do the kind of organization they had against Georgia. Um, secondly, geopolitics. Remember that, 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 for those of you who did see my presentation on Ukraine, there's that whole swath, it's like a backward sea along the eastern border of Ukraine of Russian speakers. Well, you may not want an internet blockade you may not want to turn out the electricity on a bunch of people who you think are going to be your natural supporters. You may just piss them off. So the, the, the situation was different. For the same reason you didn't get fighter, uh, fighter strikes and, and artillery barrages and SS-26 is the way we had in Georgia, uh, you probably don't want to do that. Same thing with a cyber attack. You didn't need it, so why do it? You got every Western intelligence agency in the world and Smith and Mishmidovadze looking at you. What are you going to do? Uh, maybe you don't show everything, you've got all the arrows you have in your quiver. Uh, there's a fairly robust internet infrastructure in Ukraine. Uh, we don't want to exaggerate that too much, but there's six IXPs. That's not nothing. Georgia had none. Um, there's fiber optic cable fairly redundant running along the train lines. Georgia's a narrow valley and basically has one line. Um, there's a lot of frontier portals to Western countries. So a lot of their internet traffic's going from their own IXPs out into Western countries, not into Russia. At, as Katuna told you, at, in, nine, in 2008, Georgia's 90% of Georgia's internet traffic went through Russia. So fairly easy to do. Today it's a little harder. Still has to go to an IXP outside the country, but it's, it's, going, out, it's going on an uh, uh, undersea cable from Poti in, uh, on the Black Sea coast of Georgia into Bulgaria. Um, and then there may have been, as I told you at the outset, a little bit of a mismatch between theory and practice. It's one thing to write books about how I'm going to bring down an entire society by going to the critical infrastructure and bringing down certain critical functions. It's another thing to make that happen. If you don't believe me, go read the strategic bombing survey that was done after World War II. Uh, a lot of, lot, lot of theory, but it's interesting how, how things work. On the, um, on the, on the Ukrainian side, I think you probably got so many NATO and EU advisors in Kiev telling them don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I think that pretty much explains the uh, lack of, could you advance me now, of, of action there. Just before we leave you, I just want to make a, a comment about this overall view of, inter, of, of, of information warfare. Make no mistake, Russia regards information warfare as a, a, a function that takes place 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year in war and in peace and in every arena. 
everything they do diplomatically is information warfare. Do not imagine that all of these proposals to bring down ICANN, to distribute this, the control of the internet, to give more power to the ITU, all of these things are aimed at, at, at basically wresting what they perceive to be American power away and trying to at least garner some of it for them or for their nasty friends like China and Iran, some of the Arab countries. If you looked at what happened at the Dubai conference with the ITU, it was those guys ganging up on the West, basically. And this is something we've got to recognize this for what it is. They want to block information. They don't want us to be able to supply information into their country. They want to tax it. They want to regulate it. They want to do everything they can. And if that means joining up with the Ayatollahs to try and and censor religious content and all sorts of other things, they're willing to do that. Be aware of Russian proposals in the diplomatic sphere. So if you take nothing else, take that first bullet, this unique nexus of government, crime, and business. If you think of that every time you read a newspaper story, whether it's cyber or not, about Russia, you pretty much understand 90% of what's going on in Russia. Um, the FSB is their pivotal player. I'm not going to read all of this to you. The one Achilles heel is the one that Katuna was talking about. They don't know how to handle the social media. The cat's out of the bag. Just look at what they've done with Navalny. Charge him with something. Put him in prison. No, don't put him in prison. Let him embarrass himself by running for mayor of Moscow. Put him in house arrest. No, don't put him in house arrest. No, give him another six months of house arrest. Charge him with something else. Give him a big fine. No, now we're charging him. They don't know what to do. They're scared. They've never seen demonstrations of the size that they saw after the Duma elections. Never seen that in Russia. And it came out of social media. They don't know how to handle it. And the only way Russia is ever going to change is if we make something happen inside the country. Believe me, outside the country, it isn't going to change. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have my thank you slide, please? Yes. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I know this is a little long, but I had a lot of stuff we wanted to give to you. And any uh, questions, comments, complaints, uh, we'd be pleased to hear that now. Randy. Thanks, David. Um, and, uh, and also, very, very interesting. Um, so, um, you know, Russia's playing a kind of a long term losing hand. Um, mm. Beck has said demographically they're dying. Um, economically, they are a third world country producing raw materials that the world will need less and less of in, as we go into the future. Um, uh, Goldman Sachs did a study by 2025, uh, Russia won't even be the top 20 economies of the world, mm -hmm. given, the, given the trends. Um, and so uh, looking at where they are, um, you know, what hands do they have to play? So. They're, they're obviously using these digital tools. And to your last comments, it would seem that they would be very, very vulnerable um, given this medium to long-term um, situation they're gonna find themselves in, uh, declining in, in every major category, um, that if we had the will, we could find pressure points uh, digitally uh, to make sure that uh, some of their efforts to limit uh, the free flow of information to um, uh, resist the encroachment of these decadent Western ideas like freedom and liberty and uh, letting information seek its own um, level and so forth, that they would be extraordinarily vulnerable to that. So that would tend to suggest a strategy that we should be trying to do things that exacerbate these uh, very um, acutely felt, uh, felt vulnerabilities on their part. So I'm just wondering, do you think that's a, um, you know, you both, do you think there's a viable strategy there that U.S. could either um, overtly, covertly, some combination of both be making digital efforts to make sure that um, Ivan Q, you know, citizen out there and his <coughs> or whatever is able to get free and unfettered access to what's really going on and not just necessarily what the Kremlin wants them to hear? Um, or would the, would the Russians take that as uh, an attack and, uh, uh, you know, per your earlier comments about seeing this as warfare, then take, uh, uh, take measures to respond to that. Well, uh, I'll take, I'll take the, the, the back end of your question first, Randy. I mean, they're going to see it as, as, as a hostile act. 
but I mean, what are they going to do? Annex Crimea? I, I mean, you know, at a certain point, <laughs> you know, where we are where we are. I keep hearing Western politicians say, if this continues, exactly what continue I mean I, I mean what are they gonna you know this is this is it they're threatening eastern Ukraine they're making trouble in Moldova they're agitating in Gagauzia and Transnistria everybody in Georgia thinks you know that, that, that they're next uh, so I mean I don't know what else you need to see as far as tea leaves go uh, of what is Russian policy um, so yes they're going to react negatively but you know, I think those sanctions of, uh, for example, preventing American politicians from vacationing in Siberia uh, are going to be, you know, extremely effective. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I you know, <laughs> certainly where I was headed this summer, but, oh, they won't give me a visa, sorry. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, 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 think, I think that, well, I would say three things to your, your sort of your, your strategy suggestion. First of all, to have a strategy, you have to, you have to articulate an objective can't have a strategy without an objective. you got to know a strategy for what. And it seems to me that's what's been lacking in American strategic thinking. And I'm not just laying this on the Obama administration. It's been a while before the United, since the United States had a strategy where we could say, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, I believe that the, the Russian Federation is a real thorn in the side of human development. And we need to do something about this. And until it implodes under, under its own weight, it's going to keep doing stuff like this. So if we have an objective, it seems to me that helping pushing this thing over the side might be one of them. Uh, now, what I wouldn't do is taunt the bear without an objective. The worst thing we could do is to play stupid games, taunt the bear, make them angry, have them retaliate in whatever way they're going to retaliate, and then we get cold feet and go, oh, that's not what we meant to do. So I think number one is let's. Let's, let's have a strategy. If the strategy is to bring down Russia, Putin's Russia, that's fine with me. But, but we need to be exact. And if that's not what we're about, then let's not pretend that that's what we're about. Secondly, I would say, yes, the cyber strategy is clearly a place where there have vulnerabilities, but there's many other vulnerabilities. And we ought to, we ought to be working. If you're going to do this, then do it comprehensively. For example, um, the, one of the things that we clearly need to do is there needs to be, we need to say the words. And a, a counter-Russian energy policy. You know, every time somebody says, well, why, why are you interested in Nabucco? We can, you know, we mean commercial, we, we, we can't quite answer the question, to get around Russia. For those of you in the back, I was doing that on purpose, mumbling like that, okay. Uh, um, we, 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 you know, and, and, and there's all sorts of things we could do, but that requires, I mean, everything's connected, the shin bone's att attached to the ankle bone here. Okay, that means you got to say Georgia and Azerbaijan matter to you because you want independent access to Central Asia. And we made a dreadful mistake in 2008 by not calling a spade a spade, and we need to, to, to reinforce that east-west corridor. We need to be bringing energy out of there in a big way. We need to be bringing energy not only across the Black Sea, but either back through Romania and Moldova or up through a direct pipeline connector into Ukraine. Uh, the Europeans need to start thinking about building wet liquid natural gas trains from uh, North Africa into Europe. I mean, there needs to be a strategy here. And one thing I have never understood about the West, we spend billions, trillions on military forces for security. I'm not against that. that, that, that I mean, that, that, that's fine. But all of a sudden, when it comes to something like energy, we get all queasy, well, that's the private sector. I, you know, we can't interfere with it. Why? If it's a strategic interest of the United States and NATO and the West, why can't the government basically subsidize pipelines? I mean, we do it, we don't, isn't that what we do with our military? We pay money, then there's no return on military stuff. You buy it, you know, and it, if, if you're lucky, you never get to use it in anger. Uh, uh, but basically, it toolies around the countryside, it plies the waters, it flies through the air, and one day you just retire it as obsolete. You never, you never get anything from it. Um, why aren't we willing to do something like that? I mean, we need to rethink our whole thing. The, the other thing I would say that, that we need to keep in mind, Randy, is this. Um, when you're sitting in the United States of America, um, you can have comfortable conversations, as our Vice President does frequently, about um, Russia is really imploding, don't worry about it. In the long run, these guys are going under. We don't have, it's not a strategic threat to the United States. And in a certain very isolationist way, that's true. 
Uh, is Russia ever going to be the strategic threat to the United States of America that the Soviet Union was? No, it's not going to be, at least in our lifetime. Okay. Um, the problem with an elephant dying, uh, as Katuna can tell you from Georgia, if you're the mouse in the stall and the elephant is starting to quiver and is going to about to die, it, it's a real uncomfortable thing. And that can not only squash the mouse, but in this case, I'm talking about a country like Georgia. Uh, but there might be some American interest that that mouse is harboring, too. So you know, I don't take a lot of comfort from, gee, in the next 40 or 50 years, the place will probably up and die. OK, I went on and on too long. But yeah, I think we need to do the stuff you're talking about. Katuna, you want to talk? I'm just going to add uh, a couple of things here. Uh, David mentioned uh, the David mentioned about the East-West Corridor and which, what 2008 war was. It was about the, uh, Georgia's geopolitical location that is very important. Because uh, as David mentioned, that is the alternative route to supply Europe with the Central Asian gas and oil. So this is what, 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 it, what was it about. And Putin uh, is the real brilliant geopolitical thinker. And he understands the importance uh, geopolitical location and importance um, uh, in in general, and uh, so what's really uh, and uh, uh, Western aspiration of those countries like Georgia, like is like Ukraine, those kind of things really you know make them crazy. Uh, what's what's going on in my country, for example? So uh, since uh, 2008, so. The, they are launching a lot of, uh, you know, kind of the uh, espionage uh, uh, campaign against Georgia. Now we have a new government, so you know, the previous government was a very pro-Vastifest thing. So this is the new government. There is a kind of the coalition that has the different ideas and different, you know, uh, opinion on certain issues. And what we have now, what, what we're seeing now, it's very, very dangerous. As we see, see the agit prop that's going on in Georgia. So a lot of non-governmental organizations, it's information warfare. This is how Russia sees, actually, um, to and how they actually, uh, what kind of strategy they, they proceed. So we have a lot of, we have seen that a lot of publication popped up that has a kind of the very pro-Russian, you know, kind of the um, mood or sentiments, a lot of NGOs, a lot of, you know, there was a couple of demonstration in Russia, in uh, in Georgia, that some, and they are they're trying to kind of drag the youngsters, and to kind of to show that, you know, uh, there was a couple of rallies, and those people are putting the youngsters in front, you know, they, they the youngsters are talking in front of the press, youngsters are you know, uh, um, leading the rallies and demonstration. This is I mean this is very dangerous move, and the, actually you know this is. Very open agit prop that is going on in Georgia, and it's on. And, and not only Georgia is vulnerable. You know, Georgia is very important from pro-Soviet pro republic because of the geopolitical location. But you know, those kind of the strategy um, is will be very common in some of other uh, part of the pro-Soviet space, as we've seen. What was the Putin's main? Her mission to restore the Soviet Union in a different shape that he calls the Eurasian Union. Back and then jump. I'm sorry, I can see a hand. I can't see Yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, it seems to me that it's my understanding that the uh, European, Western Europe, European Union, and NATO countries have a much bigger um, collaboration. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, but it, it, it kind of also <coughs> falls into the category of life isn't fair. You know, we've put together coalitions before 
uh, Ronald Reagan defeated a major pipeline uh, proposal in the 1980s uh, that the Europeans all wanted to come out of the Soviet Union because it simply meant cheaper energy. And uh, we managed to do that. We went to the mat. We actually defeated the thing. Uh, and, and, and the Europeans said, okay, that's it. Uh, we put together a Gulf War coalition when they weren't, uh, certainly for Gulf One, uh, when they, they weren't particularly willing. So, I mean, it can be done. And I'm not suggesting that we just go off willy-nilly and do this. I think we need to get the advice of our, of our European allies. That said, I got to tell you, um, I was at the Vilnius conference a few weeks ago. And I was really struck at the fact that there's almost two alliances. There's a Western NATO and, and, and an Eastern NATO, and it's almost like the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. I mean, there are two different alliances. They are speaking two different languages. I mean, it's, it's almost like these people don't know each other. Um, now, I was obviously very popular with the Eastern alliance um, and somewhat less uh, with our Western colleagues. Um, well, they have different economic and geopolitical uh, vantage points, of course. Um, but I think there is a real sense, even in Western Europe right now, um, that something has got to be done. I mean, you know, up until a few months ago, it was easier to keep saying, give the alligator another fish. And, you know, the Americans come in here like cowboys and they always want to do this and this and this. Uh, and that's getting hard to do uh, right now. I mean, Crimea has been annexed. It's gone. It's history. There is nothing we can do about that. That is done. They are menacing other places. I don't know whether they're going to go into eastern Ukraine or not. I think their objective in eastern Ukraine is simply to dismantle Ukraine from without, to try and force this federation, and then they'll control the, this, these, these devolved regions of eastern Ukraine will simply sort of be controlled by Russia. Uh, Moldova, I think, doesn't have such a good fate. Georgia doesn't have such a good fate. I mean, I think we need to start thinking about that. And the Europeans seem to be at a moment where they're starting at least to think about what does that mean. Yes, we're going to get resistance. I think you've got to put together a coalition. Problem you have, I think, and the argument I would make to the West Europeans is here we go. Your peace di dividend is going. We're moving forces into Eastern Europe. Not, not us. We are moving forces into Eastern Europe. You Europeans as well. We've got F-16s at uh, Shaliwai in uh, Lithuania. We've got, we're moving forces into Poland and into the Baltic countries. Uh, clearly the next move is going to be to start reinforcing areas in Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, so this is already costing money. It's already costing political chips. Uh, and I think we're gonna have to just do those things or we're gonna lose our NATO allies because they're very, very worried. You go to the Baltic countries and Poland in particular, they do not believe Article 5 is always going to hold. Um, now, it's obviously in our interest to keep saying, yes, it will, yes, it will, yes, it will. But uh, if I lived where they lived, uh, I'd, be, I'd be a little worried, too. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, but I don't know what to do. Uh, we've got to deal with this, and we may be at a moment where this is going to be the cauldron in which the post-World War II solution remakes itself. You know, I can't tell you that 10 years from today, NATO is going to look the same or if there is a, even is a NATO. I can tell you that the United States needs to start thinking about its own geopolitical interests. And I can tell you there's a lot of Europeans who see it the same way we do. Uh, whether that means we can't bring along the Portuguese and the French, then we can't bring along the Portuguese and the French. There you are. Sorry, I can something. It's, e it's easier for me to say inside a room than it is for an American politician to say on TV. But, you know, there you are. I had a great professor at LSE, Jim, when somebody would say something like in this, that in the seminar. He'd look straight at you and say, are you sure? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, mean I, 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 don't, I don't think it's likely. Well, okay, but... 
larger strategy that changed. But weren't we saying that? But 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 hang on a minute. But I, you may be right. You may be right. But but. It was pretty bleak in the 1970s too. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say in 1979, 78, 79, early part of 80. Weren't we all saying the same thing? Is 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 there's no more strategic thinking? Um, you know. Well, well, okay, that's democracy. I mean, I, I can't help that, Jim. But, 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 I mean, the reality is the country did get toge together. We elected Ronald Reagan. He did have a vision. And the, 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 the United States of America in 1981 was a very different country from the United States of America in 1979. So I'm, I'm not sure it can't happen. Um, do, I, do I see the guy out there on the horizon? No. Do I know how to make it happen? No. But, you know, yes, private sector things can happen. But I'm afraid national security... You know, and, and you know me, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, strict constructionist of the Constitution. I'd really like to keep the government very, very small. But w one of those legitimate areas of, of government action under our Constitution, including how our founders intended it, is, is national security. And I, I don't know how you're going to get a bunch of aerospace companies and oil companies together to sort of come up with a policy of their own. That that's usually requires the government calling the CEOs of those companies together and saying, now look, you know, this is what's going to have to happen here, uh, and I'll go on TV and, and publicly if I have to and, and kind of browbeat you. Tim, you want to interject and get me out of this? Well, I, yeah. I think <laughs> But you can buy our book. <laughs>
Good. Okay, we got a point. Very, very patient at the back there. When you use terms such as public-private partnerships, uh, talk about government cooperation, American corporations cooperating with the government because we have a particular strategy, certain objectives. There, there are things that I think fly in the in the face of that that we, we don't think about sometimes. For instance, give some examples. Yesterday, I heard uh, in the news there was some people from either the administration or Congress combined. They weren't named that were pleading for corporate executives, American corporation executives, not to go to the St. Petersburg World Economic Forum in May, later this month. Uh, when I saw that, I recalled a few years ago, I saw a report that came out of the St. Petersburg Conference that talked about President Putin meeting uh, with American corporate executives privately on his yacht in St. Petersburg, telling, congratulating them on the contracts that they had signed, etc. cetera. Uh, he's using the word we, we've signed these contracts, this is, this is great, and, and so forth. Now it's up to you to go back to the United States and help get these contracts working through what you can do with the Congress. It's up to you to go back and lobby mm -hmm. for, for certain things. That, that's one thing that doesn't usually come up. Another is the word globalization corporations. How can you have public-private, an American public-private partnership when the private part of that partnership is globalized and is thought of as globalized. And that intersects with what we were saying about Eastern and Western European. Uh, globalization divides strategies here. Uh, and there are other instances that are looked upon as positive by some and, and not by others. And for instance, uh, we have educational institutions that are in partnership with, in Russia there's Skolkova. In the United States, MIT is, is, is in partnership working together to provide academic resources and, and so forth. And staff go back and forth. Uh, this is looked upon as something very positive, but in, in this time, the competition is for resources here. And what actually happens is when grants are cut because of budget cuts, the grantees from one university go overseas to work in Skolkova, for instance, uh, rather than stay in the United States without a grant. And, and there are many other instances that are similar, but I, I think you have said enough about that. It, it, it just it modifies a lot of what we've, we've had in the conversation, I think. The, along that same line, and to go back to uh, what Tim was saying, uh, I think it, it seems to me that if you had a business consortium, if you had a Ben's or you know, what was it, business executives for national security, it's not so much to support a national security as to shape a national mm -hmm. strategy. What is the national strategy? I mean, to go back further, you know, you're talking with the 50s. You go back a little further to the late 30s, early, early 40s. Um, you know, the, the nation's best and brightest went to war. days, you had the best and brightest setting up OSX. You had the best and brightest all set to go into Germany and run it. Well, 
But part of the problem with the rack was we said, here, Defense Department, it's your baby. Well, yeah, it's your troops. You know, I mean, if you need cops, you know, what, you don't, don't, don't ask the Department of Defense to go tell them how to set up the judicial system. You know, go get a bunch of judges and a bunch of cops, civilian cops, and say, now, go make those people safe in their homes. That's the name of this game. You know, the hell with shock and awe. I mean, look at Bobby Franks. I have my own problem. Um, yeah, that, that, well, you know, Rick Shinseki got fired. Um, Maybe we. But, but as you as you pointed out, Dave, maybe you need a strategy. If, if the strategy is all right, we're going to free up our allies, the rest of the world, let's say, from Russian energy. Fine, if that's the strategy. But as you said, sir, that implies industrial policy. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, well, as a strict constructionist, no Republican here, I say, wait a minute, what are you talking about industrial policy? You mean you're gonna keep three suppliers of satellites just because they're the suppliers of satellites? Well, yeah. Guess what? We are. Mm -hmm. You spend trillions of dollars on a military, now spend trillions of dollars to do energy. And I don't know what that energy is. I mean, today you've got the Greens going crazy. You know, clean energy. Great. Is there a reason for it? Aside from global warming, I mean, you know, that's, that's another discussion. But if you want, what you want to do is to is to provide energy, let's say, to use you know, civilian uh, endeavor. How do you do that? Do you do it with green? Do you do it with you know offshore wind turbines? Fine. You know, do you have to tell all the people that are worried about bird strikes to go back to sleep? You know, sit down and color? Maybe. How do you do that? And to your point, the losers are all going to go running to their favorite pet congressman. Hard to do in America. But okay. if it were yep. easy, everybody. So let's move on. Yep. This, this might be a little bit of a Rob Rosen point, but uh, I'd like to make it and see what your opinion is on it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Just gonna throw it right in the punch bowl. <laughs> so this comes off, off what I often I voice this, and this is, comes off the voice shocking for a uh, native born Ukrainian. I, I'd like to offer up that we're falling into the same trap that you're accusing Putin and the, the well-to-be in, 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 in uh, Russia. We're falling into that Cold War mentality. Um, but what, what they're doing has to be bad. And, and I'll say it from this advantage point. It's a national security issue. Loose, loose nukes in Pakistan keep me up at night. North Korean nuclear underground tests keep me up at night. Chinese buying a skyscraper every five days keeps me up at night. Russia taking over predominantly Russian ethnic portions of Ukraine don't move in my for me. And again, I was born in Ukraine. I don't care. Because I'm much more, from a socioeconomic perspective, I'm much more concerned about the failing Russian economy being able to sustain its own nuclear forces and the fact that in 2050, there are studies that say they won't have enough adult males to, to man their nuclear forces. Then I am about ethnic areas of countries being taken back by those ethnic, ethnic nations. So is this, are these carryover ideas that because we grew up in the Cold War, that Ru what, anything Russia does is automatically bad, and if they're being a hegemonic state, that's bad? Or is it really, a strategic national security problem. So let me answer that. Well, you, you, you raised a good, a good point, I think. And that says, not to cut you off, but um, if you have a strategy, it seems to me, if you're an adult about this, and you understand the ge geopolitical perspectives, why can't you? I mean, it is a cold war. It is that, a cold war? It is. You think we're in a cold war? I think so. I think, I, I'm not sure that it ever will be. Well, 
going to make a point, and I'd like to make a point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you know what? Um, Russia is not only making a big problem inside the former Soviet countries, but it's making a big problem uh, in a global sense, for example. Let's say that there was a big research policy that, that's kind of the big um, new step from, uh, for, uh, from Obama administration to research relationship with Russia. What's happened, actually? So this research was about star fortification, that was about a new distribution network, and it was about, you know, to get Russians help uh, in terms of to kind of uh, in terms of actually Iran to stop Iran uh, with its nuclear uh, program. So what's happened? Right after this big you know announcement, so three months later, Lavrov and Minister of Energy went to uh, Natan's nuclear power plant, opening of the uh, uh, official opening of the Natan's nuclear power plant, and they made an open statement that we are going to continue tra uh, nuclear trade cooperation with Iran. Uh, that was actually slipping across the face to the United States. So start ratification. I don't think that that was so important for the United States. That was very important for the uh, for the Russia by itself and no distribution network. So yes, they got some help from this. But by the way, sovereign route of the Novin distribution network goes from Georgia. Thirty percent, you know. It's um, okay. Let's look about Syria. So in Latakia, they have their naval base. They have an interest there. So all the time when there is, you know, some big thing is going on, Russia is opposing the best thing country, you know, uh, United States in particular, and not only, yes? So they are helping the Bashar al-Assad. They are in, in cahoot with the Ayatollahs. You know, we're, we're, we're making a big problem. Georgia, Ukraine, there will be Moldova. What's going to be next? So, and threatening open, and even their rhetorics. By the way, if you read their national security strategy, it's very important. Let's put it aside some other things, what we, uh, you know, what is uh, about Central Asian gas and oil there, and you know, all of those geopolitics. What's there about very important Arctic region? Now we're making a big deal about the Arctic. They think that Romanovsk Ridge is the part of the real continental shelf, and several times we openly throw a challenge to the Canada, United States, that we're going to do it, and Arctic is where Russia. So, I mean, what's the thing? Is that we're, we're testing, step by step, you know? So Georgia was okay. Ukraine point, is okay. Moldova. Your, your point at what is, point? You keep, you, the, the examples you're giving, I don't disagree with, but they all speak to the influence of Russia, not to the national security issue of Russia having more land in Ukraine or anything else that we're actually but, talking but, about. But wait, so you're, you're, you're deconstructing something to a to point, though, that, that I think at some point you got you got to reconstruct things. You know? Um, it, yeah, I understand what you're pointing. Your point. If you've got a, 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 a little. Um, uh, peninsula that is inhabited 90% by ethnic Russians. Uh, although it is wrong to be doing it the way they did it, and we find this repugnant not to do it those ways, um, in the grand scheme of things, is it in the national interest of the United States to make a big issue over Crimea? I, I got your point. Yeah. But I think what Katuna is trying to tell you here is, 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 is a wider thing here. Because that is, this happened in 2008 in Georgia. Georgians are not ethnic Russians. Georgians are Georgians. Okay, they got trampled in a war that had more to do with U.S. interests in the East-West Corridor than it had anything to do with Georgia and Georgians. We were asleep. We didn't get it. Now, maybe that's not an interest of the United States, but we said it was. George Bush went in 2005 and made a stirring speech that said Georgia was the model for the East, and we needed that East-West Corridor. And then when the Russians invaded, America was nowhere to be found because we couldn't because we didn't have strategy. We had words, but no strategy. And maybe that is a strategic area where it's just a bridge too far and we leave it. I gave a presentation a couple of years ago called Alfred Thayer Mahan and uh, Georgia and the Limits of American Sea Power. Everybody laughed and said, what do you, and my point was exactly what you're saying. Maybe we don't care. Alfred McKinder warned back in 1921, if you allow the Bolsheviks to reach the reach the Black Sea, they will control Central Asia. The Bolsheviks reach the Black Sea because the British find it years. beyond their interest to act, and they control Central Asia for 70 years. Exactly what Halford McKenna said. Now, I'm telling you this. If you allow Russia 
to control Ukraine and to, to control the East-West corridor through, through, through the, the uh, South Caucasus. They will control Central Asia. The United States needs to decide. Is, do we want the American sea power to extend from the ports of Pothi and Batumi inward into Central Asia, or is our power end at Crete? And frankly, the Black Sea is a Russian lake, and that's the way it is. Okay, and may, maybe that is a strategic decision to make. I don't think it's the right strategic decision, but we haven't made that decision yet. But in the meantime, what we have is a Russia. It's not just Crimea. It's threatening Eastern Ukraine. It's threatening Moldova. It's threatening American allies to whom we have a legal obligation to defend. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have that either, but what I'm saying is by doing what you're doing, by deconstructing it, you get to a point where you know all of this stuff gets connected. And if we don't stand up to them, as I mean, what Katona's trying to say here is that they're, 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 they're probing. They're trying to see what's going to happen. And if the answer is nothing, it'll go more and more and more. Now, we have decided that Central Asia doesn't matter. So be it. And if that means that a country that both of us have some ties to in Georgia has to go under, so be it. I understand what you're saying. You came from Ukraine, and you know that, that's it. But I don't think we've made those decisions. And in the meantime, don't be surprised when Bessarabia, or do we call it Moldova now, goes under. Don't be surprised if they push us, and all of a sudden we have a NATO Article 5 issue and either NATO ceases to exist because we do not respond to an attack on Narva or something like that, or NATO has to go to war. And I think we're better off trying to stand up to them. Okay. So I, I, I kind of feel like it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room, but what is the role of the United States military in all of this? Um, you know, we've got obviously a very large deployment in Afghanistan. Um, and a token one along Eastern Europe. We have a very large Mediterranean fleet, which we've really yet to utilize in any meaningful way in the Black Sea. So what are we doing? I mean, we what? We have no strategy. Right. We don't know what we're doing because we have, we send a warship in. I mean, uh, if you want the most ludicrous example of this was when uh, G General Dempsey made the announcement that we were sending two warships into the Black Sea for the Olympics. Right. And by George, one nothing going to happen in there. And I'm sitting there going, are you, what are you going to do, land 300 Marines in Sochi? I mean, what, what um, way too many. Way too many. We only need 20. I'm a former Army intelligence officer, <laughs> and you don't need a top secret clearance to see what the Black Sea fleet has and what they're capable of and what a single U.S. carrier group can bring into that region. You can't put a carrier group there. Contra convention. Can't quite carry this. But, well, go ahead. I, I understand what you're saying. I, so let me make two points. Going back to the point. I agree with the premise that Russia will continue to push and continue to, whether it's physical land grab or whatever. We, we talked, someone was talking about this earlier, right? And that's the premise that you always have to remember that we, we equate the Cold War to the Soviet Union. The fact is that they were Soviets for a very brief period of history. They've always been Russian and always will be. My concern, and everything that was everything that was now just talked about, I would argue, without trying to make a judgmental statement, is very Cold War type of language, all right? And I don't think we're there. I think, I think we're there in some ways mentally. I'll tell you what my answer my concern, quite frankly, is not land. My concern is those little blue dots up on the map. Yep. Because they brought, they, they brought Mahan before I could. <laughs> the fact is, I, my premise is that the internet, that we, there is so much we do not know about the internet as it's developed, that we really are living in the period of Mahan. When, when this is the British Navy going out, protect the sea lanes for the for the, the East India Company. And this is, this, we don't know what's around that corner. So I would argue that by taking possession of IXPs, there will eventually be an impact on the United States that is significant because yeah. right. the internet Absolutely. today is no longer, so you've heard me say, the internet today is no longer a utility. It is now a necessity for us. Right. We cannot continue out. And and my second part of the answer is one of your point is, while I agree, what do we our <laughs> problem is with the advent of smart
AR-15 weapons many years ago, right? And with the way technology is allowed us to react, our solution to everything, I'm not saying you said this, but our solution to everything is let the military do it, okay? And the problem, and, and in fact, I would go argue, and this is not a political statement, I'm just doing timing, I would argue, when I was on the Hill and I looked at, at the um, Clinton administration, right, I had no foreign policy either. I had no active State Department, and consequently, at the end of the day, it devolved to the military, and so what I had, I didn't have commanders and chiefs around the world. I had Roman proconsuls, and I'm not blaming them. It devolved to them, right? So we have, been going back to we do not have a, a doctrine, a strategy, a policy, it can't be whose responsibility, right? It's got to be a combined responsibility that includes diplomacy and the family. We don't have that. We don't have that. Tim, thanks a lot. Uh, we promised you a 1400 cutoff, and, uh, and <coughs> only because we promised that. The discussion can go on, please. Uh, two thoughts. I would offer that the, in the dime analogy, the United States look at it, it looks at it as big M all the time. Well, if every problem's a nail, it's going to be a hammer. Maybe it should be big E, as the discussion talked about some of the corporate. And a uh, very wise retired man offered me the following thoughts about uh, a month ago. Every conventional decision is based on a nuclear capability. I thought about that, and at first I went, no, that's wrong. The longer I think about that, he's exactly right. You gotta think about it. And Randy, it goes back to the conference down in, down in Virginia. The people that have them, the people that don't have them, how you make your move, how you position yourself as a nation, just because of, of the finality that they bring to the fight. So this is something we have to tiptoe around. It's not something we can go in as an American nation and that's the way it's gonna be. And it might take the business side to put it together. How they do that? Well, businessmen have been doing this around the world for a long, long time. Hopefully they'll figure it out long before our politicians will. <laughs> so, 